It's the economy, stupid. <laughs> Bill Clinton's 1992 light bulb moment quickly became what linguists call a snow clone, endlessly customized. It's the deficit, stupid. It's the corporation, stupid. It's the recession, stupid. It's the voters, stupid. Eventually satirized in the book written by one of the characters in the political drama, The Thick of It, under the title, It's the Everything, Stupid. <laughs> Adam Smith's classic study and inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations could with equal truth be called, it's the everything stupid. In it, Smith explains how economics is the fundamental philosophy. Whatever else we each might be or aspire to become, we're all traders in the social marketplace. Those who confuse Smith with what has been done in his name by Thatcher with the Adam Smith Institute, with the extension by successive British governments of market functions into health and education, would do well to read The Wealth of Nations. It will not surprise you. It will not just surprise you. It will arm you. Read it and you'll think differently about society and about yourself. Why? First of all, because in reading it, you will meet yourself. You as you really are, as we all really are. The Scottish philosophers, of whom Smith is one, are nothing if not pragmatic in confronting our shared humanity. Smith follows the economic impulse deep into the recesses of the human personality, exposing it as the basis of our psychological and social existences. Human beings, he says, are by nature bundles of wants and desires, and it's our nature to trade. Nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. <laughs> but this propensity to barter marks us up as human. What is speech but a form of exchange? What is love but trading affection? Every man, writes Smith, lives by exchanging or becomes in some measure a merchant. Secondly, Smith embedded his economic argument within a broad cultural, intellectual, and historical inquiry into what constitutes wealth in an advanced commercial society. He makes it clear that wealth making must find a place for the very things that do not inhere in capitalism, like social justice, like well being, and the prosperity of all, commonwealth. His compelling insight is not just that every part of each one of us is in it, but they were all in it together. Thirdly, he builds his model of society under capitalism from the ground up, not the top down. Commercial society, he says, is organized on a horizontal axis, and it's the purchasing power of the many that constitutes the real wealth of nations, not just the hedge funders and city fat cats. The commodities he cites as desired by all are modest. Nice clothes, furniture, kitchen gadgets, beer. His example of a complex manufacturing operation is the humble pin. Fourthly, he understood that the connection between wealth creation and social justice must be engineered, that markets won't do it of themselves. His vision is democratic, but it's also bleak. Economic prosperity is a consequence of the division of labor down to society's lowest members, but so too is moral poverty. In advanced commercial societies, many workers, he writes, are confined in factories and on production lines. The consequence for this, in Smith's vivid phrase, is mental mutilation. Smith saw what his so-called modern disciples have refused to confront that the social and moral price paid for commercial prosperity can be too high, creating sharp differences in our quality of life, depending on the jobs we do and the places we live. It's not talent or nature that separates a philosopher from a street porter, he writes, but custom and opportunity. So think on, chaps. <laughs> Point five, Smith's remedy for mental mutilation was massive state compensation of the lowest workers in the form of lifelong education and affordable popular culture. culture. Theatres, art galleries, museums, shows, provided regardless of any apparent advantage to the state. The real advantage is the nation's well-being. Today, there is pervasive distrust of big business and uncontrolled capitalism 
and rightly so. Yet we seem to see no viable alternative. Smith understood the dilemma. He offers both biting critique and ways to ease the problems we create for ourselves. His critique could not ring more true. This is what he says. People of the same trade seldom meet together, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Think only of the big six energy suppliers and government's refusal to hold them to account. And the way to tackle the problem? Smith understood something that every 21st century politician should have tattooed on his or her forehead to be read by their opposite number daily across the floor of Parliament. It's not the economy, stupid. It's the moral economy, stupid. Because we're all in it together, and self-interest compels us to care for others. But self-interest, that's another part of the story.